Hey folks, welcome back from spring break. Uh, I know it was probably neither really spring nor a break, but uh, we are going to have a quiz on Thursday. And remember, the whole idea of grading during this, you know, post spring break time is that it cannot hurt your grade, but it can only help your grade. And so this quiz is going to cover material from that e-learning week before spring break. So I gave you three lectures that week. One was on the census, one was on the House versus the Senate, and then how a bill becomes a law. And then the third one was on something called gerrymandering. So if you didn't actually take notes on that stuff back then, uh, you certainly want to take it now because the quiz is going to be open note and it's going to be completed in a short answer online quiz format through Kansas. Kansas, Canvas, sorry about that. We'll provide you with a series of review questions tomorrow during class, as we always do. Uh, it's gonna be, again, slightly different because we're gonna give you questions ahead of time, questions that you can think about in anticipation of the quiz. There's not gonna be a review sheet like we've done in the past. Now, today we're gonna talk about lobbying. So if you look at the left, this picture, you've got something called a special interest. A special interest is somebody who has an interest in changing a policy in the government. Now, it's illegal to just hand money to a politician and say, we want you to uh, vote our way. It is, however, legal for a special interest, somebody who wants something to be done, to give some money to a lobbyist, sort of a go-between, who then gives the money to the politician to get what that special interest wants. So the left is illegal and the right is legal. And we're going to look at today just how potentially shady or important this process of lobbying is. Now, I want to take you guys back to, again, eight years that were, you know, probably from when you guys were like six and seven up through like 14. And Barack Obama was a president. And Michelle Obama, the FLOTUS, worked very hard during her husband's eight years on this campaign called Let's Move. And the goal was to get students to be more active, again, less obese. And one of the major um, propositions that she had, the policy changes she wanted to make was to encourage healthier school lunches, particularly getting rid of, again, the fatty pizzas and particularly French fries. So she went after potatoes as sort of the villain of the school lunch. Now, instead, of course, it was replaced with fruits and vegetables and healthy grains and chicken and low-fat milk. And in many cases, students actually didn't like those proposed changes. And so Michelle Obama, as, as well as her husband in many ways, tried viral campaigns to really sort of get their points across. So here's one of my all-time favorite um, pieces here uh, that does star Michelle Obama, but it stars one of my favorites, Will Ferrell, in a late night bit called Yeah, in which you will see how the innocent potato seems to be under attack. Okay, so we're just going to play a bit of this. Yes, it is super random, but I love it nonetheless. Okay. I think you're saying Ew! Yeah, Sorry. All right, Sorry. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. And talking about the air. Speed round. Let's speed round. Here we go. Okay, first up. That ain't long legs. Ew. Jelly donuts. Ew. Will Farrell. Ew. Ew. Cute. Grella? Yeah. He's like a total hottie. I can't. Then. Button down. Seriously, down. I must. <laughs> Caesar! Caesar! Caesar, that's not on! Potato chops. Ew! Yeah. You know, instead of potato chips, a healthy alternative is kale chips. Gross! Not gross! <laughs> In fact, I brought some with me. You both should try one. So grime. <laughs> Ew. Pretty good. Yeah. And the best part is they're high in omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-5. Never heard of them. All right. So at the end of the day, Michelle Obama's whole goal was to convince people 
that potato chips, fries were bad. Now, let's look at these four potato growers. And again, you know, they're potato growers from Idaho or Maine. So I don't know what their names are. Maybe like Joe Bob and Dale and Cletus and, uh, and Wilbur. I don't know. Good potato farming names. And if Michelle Obama really had her way, these potato farmers would not be smiling because their livelihood would be taken away, particularly because so many of these potatoes that are grown in the United States get put in school lunches, and that's a major market for the potato industry. So these potato farmers were understandably con concerned. They were very, very worried because think about this. If school cafeterias who serve 31 million students per day would be reducing their potato order significantly, what were they going to do? This guy right here grows taters. You know, his, his daddy probably grew taters. His great granddaddy grew taters. This guy is a potato grower in a potato growing area. What's he going to do? Go, go work for Google? Become a social studies teacher? He's not even going to necessarily be able to like grow sweet potatoes or something like that because they require different types of climates and different type of, of knowledge. So we got to think if you are stuck like this and you want to get a policy changed, what do you do? Okay. And right here, we're going to actually look at a guy who runs an organization that actually helps the potato industry, those Jim Bob, Wilbur, Cletus, gets their point across to politicians. Now, here he is on the right. His name is John Keeling, and he's going to be speaking on Fox News about how important it is to sort of protect the potato from being vilified by people like Michelle Obama. Spuds are on the verge of suspension. If the United States Department of Agriculture gets their way, potatoes at your kid's school could be a thing of the past. It's in the name of health, but it could wind up costing $6.8 billion over the next years because potatoes are cheaper. And if they replace it with other stuff, uh, you get it. John Keeling is the executive vice president and CEO of the National Potato Council, and he joins us live. Good morning to you, John. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Why has the federal government, John, declared war on potatoes? Well, it's a little bit confusing to us when you consider the nutrition of the potato, what it offers to kids, what it offers in school lunch to, to provide the nutrients that kids need, particularly potassium and fiber. So it's a little bit confusing to us why they would single out the potato since it fits in so well nutritionally with what's being offered in schools. I think I read that in March at a... Uh a hearing with the uh, secretary of the uh, agriculture department, Susan Collins, a senator from Maine, had a potato in one hand and she had a, a complete head of iceberg lettuce in the other. And she said, Mr. Secretary, this potato has twice the vitamin C as this entire head of lettuce. What's your problem with potatoes? I mean, people think, oh, if, if I think the common misconception is if you eat a lot of potatoes, you're going to get fat. Is that true? No, it's not true. In fact, potatoes have zero fat. What the secretary seemed to point to was he was concerned about the preparation method. So if we're concerned about preparation methods, let's have that discussion. Let's not vilify the potato because it does provide solid nutrition for kids. Now, OK, here's the deal. John Keeling, his job is to protect potato growers. He is basically the head of the NPC which, quote, supports the U.S. potato industry by monitoring issues affecting the strength and viability of the potato industry. Now, the key word is in the fourth line, influencing regulators and legislators. That means congressmen and women on issues crucial to the industry's long-term success. Now, if you go to page, I think it's page seven in your packet, you'll see the National Potato Council, you know, mission statement right there. Now, the definition that we need to get is of an interest group. An interest group is a group that's determined to encourage or prevent changes in public policy without trying to get anyone elected. So again, the potato growers of America are an interest group. Those guys who grow potatoes like Jim Bob and Cletus and Dale and Wilbur, they're not trying to get anyone elected. They just want to make sure that they can actually still sell their potatoes to schools. Okay, So they're an interest group. Now, they're going to lobby, they're going to seek to influence a politician or a public official on an issue. Again, the issue is they don't want their potatoes to be prohibited. They want their potatoes to still be possible to be sold in school lunches. So the interest group is the people that want something changed. Lobbying is the process by which they can get it 
changed. Okay. Now, there are two types of lobbying that we need to look at. Okay. One is called grassroots lobbying. So these potato farmers and the Jim Bobs and the Dales and Wilbers, they could call, they could email, they could write, they could tweet, they could even go meet with their congressman or congresswoman in Washington, D.C., or when they're home in their local district to promote the, just the plight of the potato and how their livelihood would be devastated, okay? Grassroots lobbying, the key here is it comes from the people themselves. There's no money exchanged, okay? This is just voters trying to influence their politicians. We see this all the time, okay? Contact your congressman, congresswoman, okay? to get the point across. That's grassroots. It comes from the people. It comes from the ground. Grassroots. Okay? Now, then you have direct lobbying. That's what John Keeling is. He's a professional lobbyist, an influencer, a persuader, who's attempting to get government officials to promote certain policies. In this case, making sure that the potato farmers that he represents can sell to schools through the promise of funds, namely money, or votes. So we can basically say, hey, here's some money for your campaign. Vote the way that uh, the potato farmers want you to. Or if you do this, you can make sure you'll get our votes. Or if you don't do this, well, then you won't get our votes. But the key question is, if the government does make a law that affects you like the potato farmers, what can you really do to change it? And really, your power to change something depends on a combination of these four factors. Again, if you have all four, it's great. Okay. Number one, how much money you have. So the tech industry has a ton of money. So therefore, they oftentimes get what they want. Number two, how many votes you have? So we talked about Gertrude a couple of weeks ago. She was that old person that I showed on the screen. The AARP, the American Association of Retired People, all old people do is vote. So if they want something, you darn, you know, better be aware, congressmen and women, that if you go against them, they're going to vote you out. How organized you are. Obviously, if you're organized, you have a better chance of getting your message heard. And lastly, how passionate you are. So, for example, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, has a belief, namely the right to bear arms, that is actually in a minority opinion in the United States. Yet they have been able to keep Congress from passing substantial you know, uh, gun control laws because they are so passionate and they communicate that passion very effectively and very clearly to congressmen and congresswomen. So money, votes, organization, and passion are different factors that can help you in your cause of lobbying, okay? Oh, there's Gertrude, oh, I forgot her, there she is. Now, I think in many cases, lobbyists are looked at very negatively. They're criticized, but we gotta pay attention to the fact that they actually can be very, very helpful, okay? So on the next page, Lobbyists are helpful because they're experts on a specific issue and or industry. The average congressman or congresswoman doesn't know anything about potatoes, okay? They might not know anything uh, about tariffs. They, they may not know anything about Alzheimer's like we saw with Seth Rogen uh, last week or, or even, again, you know, uh, migrant farmers like we saw with Stephen Colbert. So they're experts that can give their expert opinion and help the congressmen and congresswomen understand the issue. And they can provide information and advice that just men and women in Congress just wouldn't have, okay? So they provide knowledge, they provide expertise. And without lobbyists, this information never might be heard by the politician who make the laws. So again, they provide that special expertise and knowledge to help congressmen and women understand very complex issues. Again, these are politicians, they're not expert on, on everything, okay? So on the flip side, why are you know, lobbyists seen by many people as a threat to democracy? One, at the end of the day, it's very hard to find a difference between lobbying and bribery. As someone is basically saying, I'm going to give you or not give you money or make sure you get votes or make sure you don't get votes unless you vote for us. Wow. Boy, that sounds very close to you know, bribery, if not extortion. And secondly, they're unelected. Lobbyists are not elected by people, but they have tremendous influence on the writing of the laws and how politicians vote. In fact, Obamacare was actually written by lobbyists, and then it was given to somebody in Congress who officially submitted it because, again, congressmen and congresswomen are the only people that can submit anything in Congress. 
Okay. And without lobbyists, politicians would actually be more likely to probably listen to their constituents, their voters. But instead, they end up listening to the people that can promise them money and votes. Okay. So we have two reasons why lobbying helps democracy and one why it's really a hindrance to democracy. But the question is, why doesn't anyone do anything to stop lobbying and lobbyists? Like if, if most people think it's problematic, why don't they? Well, at the end of the day, the likelihood that lobbying will be limited or prohibited is decreased by the fact that basically the members of Congress who would have to pass the laws against lobbying are the ones who benefit from lobbying. So why would anybody who gets, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars from lobbyists for their campaign ever be down with a law that's like, yeah, let's get rid of this. And perhaps even more importantly, many Congress members leave Congress. So they're like, listen, my time's up or I got voted out. They'll leave their $200,000, $225,000 congressional job, go literally across the street to a high-powered lobbying firm where they can make millions of dollars basically doing what they used to do, which is just working with lawmakers. So again, there's really no incentive to end lobbying. But that shouldn't stop us from sort of pondering this question of whether lobbying is, is good or bad, okay? So remember, the completion of this Ed Puzzle lecture, what you're doing, as well as the submission of a completed daily question by 3.30 p.m. today is what determines your attendance. And in addition, I'll be grading all the daily questions and I'll include them in Infinite Campus only if they help your grade, okay? But again, you gotta do it in order to get that attendance, okay? So here's the question. As you just listened to me say in the lecture, there are two types of lobbying, the grassroots lobbying, you know, the Cletus, the Dales, the Jim Bobs, the Wilbers, the potato farmers themselves who try to influence politicians through tweeting, through, you know, letters, through phone calls without money being exchanged. And then there's direct lobbying where people like John Keeling attempt to use money and votes to try to get politicians to do what they want. So the question we have today is, in your opinion, would it be better for American politics if that direct lobbying was actually prohibited by law? We know that probably no Congress member would vote for it, but the question still stands. Would the American democracy be better if there wasn't that, you know, those experts that were, again, trying to influence congressmen and congresswomen? All right, folks. Thank you. This is our first day of our new e-learning adventure, and I look forward to seeing your answers.